Welcome to episode 63 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. My name is Rob Schenk. And I'm Will Smith. And we are your co-hosts. And we also happen to be nursing home abuse trial lawyers operating out of the state of Georgia. As this episode goes to air, it is April 9th, 2018. Um, Very close. In fact, on Friday, it will be the birthday of... Our third president, third president, Thomas Jefferson. Awesome. Well, I only <laughs> say that because I'm already prepared. I have this sheet oh, ready. Okay, okay. Is that while um, Thomas Jefferson was in fact the president during his presidency, I should say, the Seventh Amendment was ratified. And, ah, and, and okay. without looking at this paper, being an attorney for however many years going through law school will... Can you tell me what the Seventh Amendment is? It's the is? right to a trial by jury in civil cases over $20. That's right. In suits at common law, the right mm-hmm. of a trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States. I wonder if there has – has there ever been, like, an appellate decision or or or, or something like that in, involving a case where somebody sued for less than $20? And they were told you can't do that. I'm not sure if I, I don't know, but like I feel like aren't there appellate ca- and this? I'm, it's a shame that I don't know this, but isn't hasn't that increased like just through the common law, like the twenty dollar component? I don't think it has. I, I don't know. I, I feel like know. the Seventh Amendment would have to be the least litigated of the oh, amendments, it, it, ex- it with is. the exception of the quartering of troops. Oh right, right, right. The Third Amendment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would. Uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, our our current dean, uh, Dean Timmons, I'll never forget. D- at Georgia State University. At, at Georgia State University. Her husband uh, would go to, to parties and tell people that he was, he was a professor at Georgia State, and he taught the Third Amendment. <laughs> and people would be like, oh, that's really interesting. It's like, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happening with the Third Amendment nowadays. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? He is kind of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, very quickly, for anybody that's interested in the Seventh Amendment, the Seventh Amendment was a response to what? The injustices of the English crown. King George abolished trial by jury just prior to the Revolution. Still before, trials were often unfairly decided by judges loyal to the king. Um, so the founders sought to ensure that citizens could bring grievances before their peers who would impartially evaluate their claims. Now, a judge only determines the law to be applied and leaves the jury alone to determine how that law applies to the facts and thomas jefferson viewed the seventh amendment as essential for democracy and there's a famous quote most all trial lawyers have this in their email signature but it is by thomas jefferson quote i consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution end quote and you got to think like what was really going on with the the founding fathers and the decision to include the right to a trial by jury is probably that that rich landowners weren't getting their way all the time and so they were sick and tired of having uh, to deal with royalty making decisions and they wanted the other rich landowners um, their peers to be able to make decisions in cases at controversy i would have to say that uh, lucky that they did want to control oh, no, everything I, i'm for, sure yeah, for yeah, us absolutely. down the line yeah absolutely um speaking of the line um we're going to be having somebody on the telephone line here in the next couple minutes um yeah. we in other words we have yet another guest Our guests are becoming more common on this program yeah um people i don't know the yeah. words getting out about the show but anyway who is the guest for today will uh, well, it is uh, Richard Mollett, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the Consumer Voice, uh, which is a long-term care uh, advocacy uh, group. Uh, I met him at the uh, conference back in November. He is the executive director of the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, or LTCCC, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving care for seniors and the disabled through legal and policy research advocacy and education richard has served on a number of state and national consumer and government advisory groups relating to such issues as dementia nursing home and assisted living standards mandatory managed long-term care and nursing home financing and quality improvement he has written and presented trainings on a variety of long-term care issues including 
nursing home laws and regulatory standards, assisted living law and policy, dementia care and the use of antipsychotic drugs, caring and planning for an aging person with disabilities, and the Affordable Care Act, what seniors need to know about long-term care and elder justice. Richard is a graduate of Howard University School of Law and a member of the Maryland Bar. Um, when I went to the conference and met him, he was actually presenting on the new changes and what people needed to know about the new regulatory changes that went into effect last November for CMS. So, oh, okay. So it'll be interesting to talk to him about those changes and, and how they have not, not been enforced. How about they been enforced? But at yeah. any rate, we got him on the line. Um, Richard, welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me on. I appreciate it. So, Richard, we um, we met last uh, fall at the Consumer Voice Conference, uh, and I really enjoyed your presentation on um, the the new changes on what surveyors and and um, advocates of long term care residents need to know. But but first, just kind of give us an overview of of what your organization is. Sure. So we are a uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We're actually pretty small, and we focus on improving care and quality of life for residents in nursing homes and in assisted living primarily. So, and most of our work, I would say, is on is on nursing home issues. Okay. So, and we also are entirely dedicated to from, from the resident perspective. So we don't, uh, you know, occasionally we'll do trainings or give information to nursing home uh, providers, but we are entirely focused and entirely dedicated on the resident uh, and family perspective. And and you guys are located in, in New York, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, but we have actually, uh, if I may mention our website, nursinghome411.org, we have resources for uh, residents and families and you know advocates, people who work with them, uh, for around the country. So we put data out uh, in easy to use format for people to find out about staffing levels in the nursing homes, find out about um, citations for the nursing homes, find out for things like antipsychotic drugging in their nursing homes. And we have a lot of material, uh, including what we're going to talk about today, that are applicable nationwide. That's a, an extremely helpful website. And we're going to make sure that, that that goes up on the screen here. Uh, because one of the things that happens a lot of times is we get all types of calls, not just for um, individuals looking to uh, have make a legal claim, but also people that just have questions like, hey, is this a good nursing home or where should I put my loved one? So any information like this, Nursing Home 411, I, I think people are going to really uh, appreciate. Great, great. Thanks. No, and I, I, I mean... Obviously, I agree with this. That's a lot of the work that we do. But I felt, you know, especially now as a lot of things are changing in the nursing home system, and uh, frankly, over the past year, we're seeing a lot of the basic protections being undermined. That it's really important for people to know what their rights are, and the people who work with them, the families, um, you know, attorneys, advocates, etc., to know uh, exactly what a resident's rights are in terms of certain care requirements, et cetera, and how to advocate for them. Right. And so I want to kind of, I want to get into that too. And and before I do, I just want to um, uh, let our, let our listeners know that before 1987, it was kind of like the wild West. I, I know at the conference, I was talking to a very old school ombudsman who remembered um nursing homes before the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 87, which included the Nursing Home Reform Act. And she said it was just, it was one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, and now we have these new rules um, and they're, you know, it is getting better for residents, but tell us what's going on now. Cause when you and I, when you and I met in November, we were right on the cusp of the second phase of three phases. Can you explain what was going on with that? Sure. So maybe, and, you know, obviously the consensus is fine, but a, a brief background might be helpful. Uh, so any any nursing home that takes in any amount of money from Medicaid or Medicare is required to abide by that nursing home reform law from 1987. Mm -hmm. And the regulations came out about five years after the reform law was uh, passed in 1987. 
and they have not been changed until uh, 2016. So a lot of the work that we have been focused on is a result of that change, as you mentioned. But every, as I said, every nursing home is required to meet those standards, every nursing home that's licensed, and they're required to meet those standards for every single resident in the facility, whether it's private pay, whether it is uh, if their care is paid for through Medicare, Medicaid, their Uncle Jack, it doesn't matter. Um, those These rules that we talk about apply to everyone in the facility. So what happened is that, you know, over 25 years from, say, 1992 to 2015-16, things obviously changed. We have a better understanding of uh, what people want when they get older, what they have a right to as they get older. We have a better understanding of dementia and the lives of people with dementia and what makes that uh, good or bad, uh, appropriate care, et cetera. Now, CMS, that's the Census for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they did develop um, changes throughout the course of, of those 25 years with through what we call s and memos. Uh, so over time, there have been little tweaks, et cetera, to the regulation. What CMS did in 2015-16 is that they completely revised the regulation. So a couple of important Important points here. Excuse me. Uh, they they have implemented those regulations over a three year period. So uh, the first phase was 2016, November 2016. The second phase, as you mentioned, was just this past November, uh, and then the third phase is in another two years. What I tell people, and I think is really important for families and residents and everyone who works for them to understand is that that nursing home reform law that you mentioned, the 1987 um, Omnibus Reconciliation Act, that has not changed. The basic standards that we talk about have not changed. And so if some of the language has changed, some of the expectations, as I said, like for dementia care, et cetera, they, the guidelines about that have changed. The, the understanding of what our expectations are have changed, but the basic standard have remained the same. And the reason why I think that's so important is because we were afraid that uh, with these changes going on with the with, with the survey system, which we'll talk about today, and that was the subject, of course, of my uh, presentation, but also that the changes to the regulation would mean oh, providers don't know what to do any longer. Surveyors, the inspectors, don't know what to do any longer. That the nursing homes could use as an excuse, well, things have changed and we don't know. And it's important for people to understand, no, those basic rights have not changed. The basic standards have not changed at all. So what was the That's, what was the impetus yep. for the change then? I, you know, I, we were, the advocates that I work with, we were not happy that they were doing, you know, making these changes. I think that part of it was that they did have these memos over the course of the years that did plug in different, guidance and different um, language, the regulations, so that they wanted to kind of rework that all over again, in a sense. Um, but I, I mean, I, I personally don't think it was the best idea. A lot of what we see, to be honest, in terms of the changes that go on over the years with nursing homes and with nursing home payments and you know, reimbursement for care, et cetera, is that, frankly, you know, we have, unfortunately, a lot of bad nursing home operators out there. And that is why we have always strongly supported, uh, you know, attorneys and the right of people to go to court when they or their loved one has been the subject of abuse or neglect. Uh, but the, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you guys didn't like the changes. I, I know that there was a oh, yeah. lot of grumbling about the the changes in the F tags. Sorry about that. So right. So so you know essentially you know all these changes, they, all these changes were implemented. The standards essentially remain the same, and we were just so concerned that sure. this is and, and, and are still concerned that this is going to lead to a lot of confusion. Now you had mentioned F tags. So essentially. The, you know, we have the nursing home law, nursing reform law, and again, that has not changed. It's from 1987. And then you have the regulations, and the regulations were essentially revised, but again, they're all based on the same standards. So, for instance, a resident has a right to receive care, and the expectation is that they will not 
develop a pressure ulcer mm. unless it was absolutely unavoidable. Right. That is lost, lost since 1987. It's been in the regulations since 1991, and it continues to be in the revised regulation. Mm-hmm. Um, so the difference could be in terms of what the expectation is for the nursing home to be self-assessing whether or not it is has the staff training and the sufficient staff to be meeting those needs. That is something that is that quality assurance kind of component is something that is new in the new regulations. But again, that standard has existed. And that I know is still a serious problem. And in fact, that those are one of the things that we one of the issues on which we have data for every nursing home that we publish you know, periodically when the data are updated. So you can see what are the pressure ulcer rates in you know, nursing homes in my community, nursing homes that I'm taking about, et cetera. So that, that I think is a really good example. Antipsychotic drugging is another example that you know, seven years ago, the U.S. Inspector General found that one out of four nursing home residents were being given antipsychotic drugs, which carry a black box warning against use on elderly people with dementia. And black box uh, is, is what, it, for our viewers, what does black box mean? So the FDA uh, reviews, you know, reviews medications, et cetera. A black box warning is its highest possible warning. Right. And essentially what they say in their black box warning is that um, these drugs in particular have a high risk of death. They also have a high risk of stroke um, and heart attack, fall, uh, Parkinsonism, which is not Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's like syndrome and attorneys that I know excuse me that I've spoken to over the years have said that they've had clients who were on these drugs who developed the you know, shakes and the you know, other Parkinson's like syndrome and even when they were taken off the drugs that those um, shaking didn't go away. Yeah. Uh, so that's why, you know, that's just some of the reasons why there is a black box warning against use of these drugs. So what CMS essentially did is they I would say beefed up a little bit the requirements in, in 2016 by requiring that the pharmacists review medical records of anyone who is taking these drugs at least on a monthly basis. But again, that's because we have, even though this was prohibited, prohibited excuse me, in, in 1991, that we still have, we had, you know, 20 years later, 20, you know, 22 years later, we had still had 25% of residents receiving these drugs. I'm not a clinician, but I know how to read. And I, you know, went online, I looked at the CDC website, I looked at, at scientific journals, 1.5% of the entire population will ever have a diagnosis that CMS uses when it risk adjusts for appropriate use of these drugs. And just... And just to explain to our to our listeners, what's going on here is, and we, I think we've had a, a an episode about this before, is antipsychotics can be used as a form of chemical restraint. So you've got Mr. Johnson who's roaming the halls and he's getting into other residents, um, you know, rooms, and he's an annoyance to the staff, or he's you know uh, maybe a, a little aggressive, but he's not really a harm to himself or others. It is easy for them to sedate him and give him, you know, some sort of sedative or, or psychotropic or antipsychotic, and and that's against his his rights as a resident. Correct, and then, and, and in so many ways, I mean, there, there's a prohibition against the use of chemical restraint, uh, as you mentioned. There is a prohibition against the use of drugs that are not necessary sure. to treat specific clinical conditions. With the use of antipsychotic drugs, if someone is put on an antipsychotic because, uh, say, they become very agitated and are a danger to themselves or others, there's mm-hmm. protocol requirements that two things happen. One, that there is gradual dose reduction, that the facility is looking uh, to ensure that the dosage of that drug goes down, down, down. And the other thing is non-pharmacological approaches that the facility is also looking to see, you know, what is going on with this person? How can we treat it? Because we know that, uh, one, all dementia-related behaviors, as, as they're called, you know, scratching, spitting, crying, whatever whatever that, that might be, they are all an expression of something that is going on with the resident. And too often, 
the caregivers, the, you know, the, the nursing home staff don't understand that, and they may take something personally, or they will go on a, a resident or engage with a resident in uh, a negative way. But then it's very important, I think, for families and you know everyone who works with them to know that those so-called behaviors, they're an expression, something is going on with me. I'm scared, or I'm bored, or I have a backache, or I'm constipated, or whatever. And I can't say, because I have dementia, I can't say, look, my tummy hurts. Mm -hmm. Or look, you scared me when you grabbed me from behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, I think, really, really critical for people to understand, because so much of what we come across in poor care, uh, unfortunately, a substantial amount is, you know, lack of training, and especially with, for people with dementia, a lack of training and understanding of care for a resident with dementia. And that is just to circle back. That is a really good example because those requirements were, again, always there from the 1987 law to the 1991 um, regulations. And again, that no chemical restraints, no inappropriate use of drugs, etc. So, um, who, and, and this is a very basic uh overview and in and, and, and question but when we talk about these regulations who is it that's enforcing them who the, so the state the, surveyors yeah yeah the, the centers for medicare and medicaid services that's the federal agency it operates under the president of the united states and they are responsible for two things paying nursing homes for the care they provide and overseeing nursing homes and ensuring that they're providing good care to residents 24 hours a day seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. They contract with um, state survey agencies. And usually it's the Department of Health or Department of Public Health um, in, in the state. And those states pay the nursing homes, and they are responsible for overseeing the nursing homes. They do that. I think it's, it's important to, to note in two basic ways. One is that they are responsible for responding to complaints from residents, families, workers, etc. And two, and, and most importantly, is that they have to conduct uh, essentially an annual survey. The survey can be between nine and 15 month period, but it's supposed to be a surprise survey and the state is required to have an average of an annual survey. It's not they're not in compliance with their contract. And this is something that, that you know I've studied a lot over the years is that there is a it's called the state operations manual that detail. And that's the reason why I wanted to mention that, because too often, frankly, our research, uh, government research has found that states do not do a good job identifying when there is uh, noncompliance with minimum standards, when there's abuse or neglect. And even when they do identify those problems, they often don't cite a facility. They don't penalize a facility. And if they don't penalize a the facility, then they don't make change. And that, again, gets back to why We've always been, you know, so supportive of the role of attorneys because oftentimes that's the only place, the only um, area in which a resident and family can get some kind of um, have their voices heard and get some kind of uh, justice. What's your understanding as to why? What's your opinion as to why the the regulatory bodies are not able to execute and effectuate the regulations appropriately? In your opinion. The nursing home industry is extremely powerful. Uh, and, you know, as an aside, the, the pharmaceutical industry is also extremely powerful, probably even even more so because it's, it's such a, um, uh, a money center in our society. So that's why we have the issue with antipsychotic drugs, uh, in short. But I would say in terms of oversight is that the nursing home industry is very powerful, both on the federal level and on the state level. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but one of the issues that we, about which we're very concerned for residents and families, et cetera, right now, is that as soon as the uh, the last presidential election, the nursing home industry wrote letters to President-elect Trump, Trump, excuse me, then to President Trump, and then to the head of CMS, saying, oh, we need to have less regulations. We need to have even lower enforcement. Uh, so these these have been 
such significant issues for residents over the years that are people who know who go to a nursing home and a nursing home is not very good and then they still might find that it's a three star or four star or five star facility that the system does not adequately address problems in nursing homes. And um, that's why again you didn't invite me on to speak about, you know, lawyers, but that's again why we have always been so supportive of, of the private bar because that's only uh, oftentimes the only place where someone can get justice. And, and or, you know, on occasion the ombudsman. Um I had uh, I had the chance to have lunch with Melanie McNeil, who's the um, head of the ombudsman here in, in Georgia. But the problem there is that they're super un- underfunded and often neglected. Yeah, they're, they're going around a thousand different directions. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's 155 yeah. counties in yeah. Georgia, and she she may have a staff of, I don't, I don't know, like 60 people. It's just impossible, you know, for her to deal yeah, with. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for mentioning this. So there are, there are advocacy organizations. Um, my organization, we're, we're an advocacy organization, excuse me, but we focus on systemic issues. So sure. that's, yeah, absolutely. You know, Areas of our expertise, but there are grassroots organizations that do help people um, who are aging or people with disabilities that they can go to. Uh, and also, there is the Long Term Care Ombudsman Program. So, the Ombudsman Program, just very briefly, under the Older Americans Act, every single state is required to have a Long Term Care Ombudsman Program. And those Ombudsman Programs, there's actually new regulations out uh, as of about three years ago. The, the the Ombudsman program operated since the 70s without any regulation in terms of what was expected. You, you spoke about speaking to Melanie in, um, in Georgia, excuse me. Uh, so they would, the state was required to have an Ombudsman like Melanie, and she was required to then be doing monitoring and helping residents, et cetera, within their nursing homes and assisted living uh, and, and other residential care facilities. But there were no other instructions for what they were supposed to do. Right. So part of the uh, strength of the Amazon program is that they are entitled to go into every facility. The facilities can't say, no, we don't want you here. Uh, they are entitled and responsible for helping residents and families uh, resolve problems. They can also help residents and families develop resident and family councils, which makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, studies have shown that having a family council, for instance, uh, improves the care for all residents in the facility, so that's something we also highly recommend. But the uh, the problem with the ombudsman quite often is, as you were saying, they are tend to be very underfunded. They do not have regulatory authority. So again, it's only that CMS, Department of Health Nexus, that can penalize the facility when they're found to be out of compliance. So it, it's a little bit different. And then also, because there is, you know, historically the lack of requirements for the arms and program and the underfunding, they tend to be even more, I would say, and this is just generally speaking, not for every state, but they tend to be more politicized than the state survey agencies or the departments of health. Well, do you think that, speaking of which, do you think that um, the the new administration is – is affecting um, CMS negatively, and you I I mean, go ahead. Yeah, we we do too. Yeah. So, and yeah. we talk about no, it so many I, times on this program. I, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm glad, and that's uh, that's something that could be you know certainly the focus of of, of, of its own program. I oh, think people yeah. really about which people should certainly be aware. But as I mentioned before, when we were talking about the power of the industry, so your know, nursing home residents. When you think about it, you know, they have a Amazon volunteer usually uh, who may come in weekly, sometimes may only come in quarterly or not at all into their facility. They don't have lobbyists that I know of. I don't know of any residents of their own lobbyists. The nursing home industry, nursing home providers, have two major lobby associations. Um, and in addition to that, they, there's a lot of lobbying law firms on both the state and the federal level Mm -hmm. that lobby on behalf of the interests of nursing homes, not on behalf of the interests of the residents. Is there anybody Uh, that does that? Yeah. Just to circle back quickly to the um, current administration, that we are, again, a non-profit organization. We are not neither Republican nor Democrat. We, We don't get involved in those things. But the truth is, 
that the lobby associations immediately, as I said before, wrote to President-elect Trump, have since written to President Trump and to to his administration at CMS and said, we need you to reduce these regulations. Uh, they, They literally said in one of their letters, we love caring for elderly Americans, but the regulations are just too hard for us to abide by. Um, so that, that, so we're seeing, you know, a lot of these regulations are being cut, 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 and the enforcement, which has always been pretty poor nationwide, also we're, being, we're seeing it cut, cut, cut as well. Uh, and that has had a lot of impacts already, and the threat is, is much larger going forward, is that we expect that they will have a wholesale um, change to the nursing home regulations uh, starting this summer. That's been published in the um, on the Federal Registry website. And just just so our, our listeners understand this, when when Richard's talking about the 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 special interests of the nursing home industry, this is a healthcare industry that has billions of dollars. So they they have a lot of money. Who who is on your side? Who is on Consumer Voice side? On the ombudsman side? Are there any special interest group out there that are? How do you get money? Uh, well, there's there's no lobbying group. I mean, when we go to, for instance, we've been going to uh, to visit Congress, you know, especially since the since we've seen implementation of a lot of these industry lobbyist requests. They mm-hmm. delayed enforcement. They delayed implementation of a lot of important standards related to use of antibiotics and caring for residents when they come into a facility, et cetera. They, they've managed very briefly um, to put off implementation of some of those very basic standards. Uh, so when we go to, to you know, what we call Capitol Hill, uh, usually it's with, you know, a representative from Consumer Voice, someone from Center for Medicare Advocacy, uh, my organization, uh, Justice and Aging. So there are small organizations, you know, relatively small organizations compared to the industry lobbyists who do work on these issues, but I'm not a lobbyist. I mean, I, I do, I run a small organization, I develop the materials we talk about, I do education, et cetera, but yeah. I'm not a lobbyist the way that uh, Leading Age, which is one of the lobby associations, or the American Healthcare Association, they have teams of paid lobbyists, and in addition, there are very high-priced law firms on both the state and the federal level that are in, you know, the halls of your legislature, you know, all the time, and in the halls of Congress all the time. And they've got money too. So I mean, at the end of the day, you need you know, you need money for your campaign, whatever. I mean, when you have money, money talks. I mean, it's it's the best thing. Um, so let's let's talk about some of these changes, though. Uh, you mentioned that these changes are not being implemented. What what's what's going on with that? Sure. Well, as we we said, the regulations. You know, the basic standards have existed for since 1987. The regulations implementing them have changed a bit uh, over the past, and are changing over the past couple, you know, this year, last year, and, and, and 2019, excuse me. But the what is going on is that a couple of things. One is that the nursing home lobbyists have pinpointed some of these standards that they either don't want to go into effect, that they want, that did go into effect, and they want to backpedal on, and also there have been changes to how those standards are implemented through penalties. So very quickly, for instance, uh, the industry asked for a one-year delay in some of the regulations that were coming out in 2000, you know, last November, November 2017. And those include... Uh, what's called antibiotic stewardship. So as, as I'm sure many people in the audience know, the misuse of antibiotics is a very serious problem across settings, you know, including at home, that antibiotics are becoming less effective because they've been overused so much. So the way CMS addressed it is to have, make sure that nursing homes have what's called an antibiotic stewardship program, and that went into effect in November of 2017. Another issue, as I mentioned, is dealing with people um, with dementia. Now, nursing homes have always had a large percentage of residents who have dementia. And whenever a nursing home takes in a resident, they are 
guaranteeing that they have the skills necessary to meet the needs of those residents. What CMS did in 2016 is they said, look, we want you to make sure that you have a program in place to care for these uh, you know, so-called beha- behavioral symptoms of dementia. Uh, so that's one of the rules that the industry said, well, you know what, can you delay it for a year because we need more training, which to me is frankly ridiculous because this is something that you know, people have with dementia have been going to nursing homes for decades, you know, generations, obviously. That's often why people wind up in a nursing home. To, so to say that you need more training um, defies credibility. Excuse me. Uh, so what CMS did, those are a couple of the couple of examples. What CMS did was they actually took the industry's request for a one-year delay, and they came out with an 18-month delay. So there are about a half dozen regu- regulatory standards, including antibiotic stewardship, including uh, management of behavioral symptoms, including uh, having a baseline care plan for residents when they enter a facility, that CMS is saying, we're not changing right now the regulation. That still exists, but we're not going to enforce it. Yeah, with, we've, we've said <laughs> in, yeah, in right. previous episodes that, you know, the, the Trump administration is in the pocket of the nursing home. Lobby. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, but um, Richard, um, we're, we would love to have you on um, again. We're at we're reaching the end of this particular episode. But um, if we can get you back next week um, to, to continue talking about this subject and what you do um, at the long term care uh, community coalition. But a, as of right now, for our listeners, can you can you tell them, direct them how they can get um, your information, your website, your Twitter feed, all that kind of stuff? Oh, sure. So our website, again, is nursinghome411.org, uh, nursinghome411.org. And our we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash LTCCC. And on Twitter, our Twitter handle is LTC Consumer, L-T-C, and then consumer spelled out. All these are, there's no dashes or dots or anything else. So it's LTC. C O N S U M E R. On Twitter and on Facebook, we, we post, you know, uh, news reports, you know, action alerts, things that people should know about what is, you know, we think to know about, about what's going on. Uh, also, some of our programs, et cetera. Everything on our website is absolutely free. Uh, we're re- really happy for people, including Amazon programs, et cetera, to uh, copy and use these materials in their training. Uh, I, I do. Uh, occasional webinars, and they're also all on our YouTube channel, which is accessible through the website. And I think it's just so important as all these changes are taking place, and now we're seeing some issues with the, frankly, with the Trump administration trying to remove some of these basic standards that people know what their rights are and they know what questions to ask, whether they're talking to their caregiver in a nursing home, whether they're talking to an attorney that they've called up, whether they're talking to an ombudsman, it is so helpful for families and residents to know, you know, basically what their rights are. And we have a lot of good materials. We do fact sheets on, on residents' rights that we think are, or have identified as important. So it's just a two-pager that people can copy and use uh, to identify, uh, you know, what is going on, to understand, you know, what is going on with their residents and what their rights are. Yeah, the, the site is fantastic. Will and I have gone to it several times. I mean, there's a there's a wealth of information. Yeah. We appreciate all the work that you're doing, and we appreciate you coming on the podcast. And we can't wait. We look forward to having you on again, Richard. Great. Well, thank. Obviously, there's so much going on that I I, I, I hope it was it was um, uh, it came across because there, there's so many things changing between the new regulations and, of course, what's going on with the Trump administration. And in the changes yeah, in the no survey, doubt. which we didn't even get to, but yeah. I, um, uh, you know, whatever we could do to make people aware, we certainly appreciate your your doing this as a public service, and and thank you again for inviting me. You're very welcome. Thanks Absolutely. a lot, Richard. Man, Richard, th- th- he's on it. Like he's he really is fighting the good fight. And this is what I like about um, because I had mentioned before that the Consumer Voice Conference was largely uh, ombudsmen and and other other advocates for uh, long-term care residents uh, is that these people are, are not doing it for the money. I mean, this is, this is not, you know, um, what you, you go into hoping to, to make bank. I mean, these aren't lobbyists uh, on, on K street. These aren't uh, people at, at huge law firms. 
these are passionate advocates who are working at nonprofits, and without them, there would be no one, um, no one on the side of uh, nursing home residents in Washington. And fortunately, we have them. So that's yeah. that's amazing. Speaking of on the side, um, I'm surprised that we've gone this entire episode without Will making a comment about what's on the side of the table that we're sitting at, which is, uh, in answer to that question, a GoPro camera. Oh, yeah. So Gene, uh, I don't know like if Gene bikes, motorbikes, or goes downhill skis or whatever, but he sure. is lending to the show a GoPro camera to maybe make this a two-camera show. So... You, there's a red blinking light, so something's going on in the camera. It, right, whether so, it's capturing anything, I don't know. So but. essentially, if it if it has captured, then what Gene's going to do is um, the this video, it, this podcast. If you watch the video, you should be able to catch it from multiple different angles. From multiple angles, and like a behind the scenes angle, because it looks like the GoPro. It's like you know, you can see some of the the mixing board. Yeah, you know. You know, in case you wanted to get closer up to Will's face, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, this concludes episode number 63 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. We are certainly happy that you've made it this far. Um, as always, uh, new episodes are available on Monday mornings for download on Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, Pod Happy, whatever the podcast app of your of your liking yeah, is there's pocket pod i don't know whatever there is of them. and yeah. then of course you can always watch this and again we encourage you to watch it because now there's possibly two different point of views that you right. can watch us from on our youtube channel or the, our website which is nursing home abuse podcast and dot com and with that uh, we will see you next time see you next time thanks for tuning in to the nursing home abuse podcast Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, and feel free to leave us some feedback. And for more information about the topics discussed in this episode, check out the show website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. That's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.